just going to talk about the foundation, the basics of zoning. So what I'll talk about first is just zoning itself. Then we're going to talk about Bob and his project and rezoning. And then um, finally, we'll get into Bob has to go to the Urban Design Commission. We'll also talk about urban forestry and all that. So what is zoning? What does zoning regulate? Um, zoning is basically the grouping together of compatible development, uh, a practice known as zoning. Before you can do like anything within the city, you have to make sure that your zoning allows that use. Um, so if you need to change the zoning, the zoning commission and city council are the ones who change. This is kind of high level for y'all. The zoning commission is the one and city council are the ones who make that zoning change. And Bob the Builder is actually working right now. So, um, so uh, zoning regulations and districts are adopted to help implement the comprehensive plan. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So um, you have planning documents within the city of Fort Worth, like the comprehensive plan, uh, Lake Worth master plan, Arlington master plan, but you also have the regulatory aspect of it, which is what I do in zoning. And that's the zoning ordinance, the zoning maps, and things to that nature. Those are the things that you will use whenever you're trying to develop your site. So what do we regulate in zoning? Zoning regulates a bunch of different things. They regulate lot size, setbacks, height. Uh, there's definitions of uses, uh, landscaping, parking, all those different things we, we regulate within the zoning realm. So, um, it's really kind of cool and, and easy to understand how zoning works because zoning is kind of hierarchical, if, if that's how you say it correctly. <laughs> but um, basically, um, the, we're alphabetical to where the higher the um, alphabet, the more uses you can do. So, for example, uh, in our residential zoning districts, it starts out with A. A is our single family zoning districts. But then you get to B, you can do duplex, and you get to C, you can do multifamily, and it follows that line of thinking. So the higher the alphabet, the more intense uses you can have on that site. So that's an easy way to remember it. So A, B, C, D are our residential districts. Again, A is our single family, D is our multifamily. Then you have our commercial districts. You have E, F and G, uh, again, E is our neighborhood. G is what you would find maybe near uh, a freeway or something to that nature. And just so you know, um, in G zoning, all, you can do all uses in E and F. So that's, that's pretty um, neat. So and then you have your industrial districts. You have your I, J, and K. I is our lighter industrial. K is our heavy. J is in, in the medium. Then you have what Bob has. He has he wants to go to a mixed use district. Now our mixed use districts are kind of cool because they allow both residential and commercial uses, hence the mixed use. So you have a lower form of mixed use, which is more neighborhood commercial uh, like. So you're in U1, and then you have your NU2, which is a little bit higher level, uh, allows more height. Then you have your form-based districts and it's based on form and function in your, like your near south side districts, stockyards districts, and they allow a mix of uses as well. Um, that's a little bit more about urban design districts. Oh, these are, you want to talk about, let's talk, let's talk about urban design districts because we're going to find out later that Bob has to go to the urban design district. So yeah, let's talk uh, with Mia right now. Okay, thank you. So we are looking at the district like uh, Steve just uh, introduced. So on the left side, that's a form-based code. So these are the district that use form-based code. So on the right-hand side, you will see that uh, each, you, uh, each district has its own unique code. So you have to apply for the district and uh, looking for what uh, COA that you need to apply for. So there are several conditions that the, you need a COA before you get go to the permit. So these are the several of them, but uh, I read the ones on the uh, application form. So first one, you when you construct a new structure, and second one, you uh, you do an expansion of an existing structure, and uh, third, you can uh, when you do an alteration of the exterior of an existing structure. 
and fourth, you construct of a surface parking lot, and uh, fifth, you construct a sidewalk or other roadside improvements within a public right of way. And last one, when you uh, install a permanent uh, signage. Okay, uh, next one is about the um, timeline of one application. So roughly it's one to eight weeks process for an administrative approval. And uh, another type is urban design commission. When you need a waiver, you need to go to the UDC. So it takes longer, it's like three to eight weeks. And uh, the COA has some uh, requirements. So uh, you can check the uh, website for all these requirement documents. And uh, our, um, uh, our public hearing is a hybrid uh, style. So you can go in person or you can use a web, web box to join online. So on the right hand side, you can see there's our um, timeline. We will show this on the website to tell you when it's a deadline for the applicant, when we will send out the notice, and when is a hearing. Next. Uh, this is uh, urban design district steps. So first one, you can go to check the zoning map to see which district you are in, what, what, what kind of uh, overlay district or what kind of phone based code you need to apply. And the second one, uh, when you apply for a COA, you can do it online. And step three, when you apply online, maybe uh, the staff will ask you for some uh, information so you can work with our staff to finish the uh, application. Next. So uh, next one is uh, COA process. So you can see on the right hand side, we have, we go two different roads. So when you apply for the COA, our staff will review first. So there will become two different conditions. If you fully comply with the code, we can do the administrative approval. So that would be a faster. It will go to the right hand side. If not, you need a waiver. Then you go to the UDC for the hearing. So we will recommend that you go to the neighborhood organization to get their support. And then we will give you a, a notice before the UDC hearing. Then we will complete the process after the uh, UDC meeting. That's it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on down the road. So we also have a thing um, called a plan development district. This is kind of your curveball in zoning. A PD is your own zoning district. And as from a staff perspective, we kind of steer people away from this, but sometimes it's a, a needed function. A PD basically is its own district. Um, a site plan is generally required and typically the neighborhoods and council members like that because it sets the stage for exactly what's going on to, on the land. So with your standard zoning change, we'll get into that here in a second, you don't have to provide a site plan. But for a PD, uh, the neighborhoods and the council members know exactly what's going on the site. So that's why a lot of uh, the neighborhoods like the PDs. So what does the zoning district mean? We have lots of different tools that you all can use to pull up. We have a zoning ordinance. It's over 500 pages, and sometimes it can be uh, difficult to, to peruse through. We also have a land use table, which I'll talk about here in a second. And we have supplemental standards uh, for some of our uses. So for example, an automotive use, you can't just put an automotive use right next to residential because sometimes automotive uses can be noisy. So we have supplemental standards that would help um, alleviate that. So this is one of the nicest tools that we have whenever you go to a zoning ordinance, because whenever you're trying to find out, especially in this case, let's say Bob wanted to find out what his zoning was, he would go to our land use table uh, and see what use he wanted to do. And right over here, if you can see, you have the uses right here, you have the zoning districts up here, and you have the supplemental standards over here, but if it has a P next to it, that means it's permitted use. So 
you can do your uh, homework on your own and, and find out, hey, is the thing that I want to do in this situation allowed by right? So you have that zoning use table, and that table is located in our ordinance, and uh, we can get you uh, whatever information you need uh, to help you uh, with that. Uh, we also have a, a thing called the comprehensive plan, and this is really important because whenever you're looking at your site to develop, um, you need to know what the comprehensive plan calls for that site. Because the comprehensive plan is the guide for growth for the city of Fort Worth. It's like the city of Fort Worth thinks that in 20 to 25 years, this is what that you should be on the site. And the reason why that's important is because whenever staff is looking at a site, whenever there's a zoning change, the staff looks at the comprehensive plan. So for example, if you wanna do a commercial use or if Bob wanted to do that mixed use, whenever we're analyzing uh, through our staff reports, we're looking at the comprehensive plan to see if that matches. And if it doesn't, it could really um, be detrimental to your case in some, some instances. So the comprehensive plan, the guide for growth is really important um, thing to kind of know about. So in the comprehensive plan, we have a, a future land use map, and that's what we kind of look at, but we also look at policies within the comprehensive plan to see if they're matching what your Bob or you are trying to do. So the city of Fort Worth, we, we implement the future land use plan whenever there's a zoning change. Um, the maps and policies, are, again, are referred to in our staff reports, and um, that's, that's why the comprehensive plan is important. So let's get back to Bob real quick, because I know y'all had the uh, kind of introduction to that project. So whenever Bob was looking, he looked at his um, zoning map, that's the first thing he kind of did. He noticed that he had ag zoning, and ag zoning doesn't allow what he wants to do. He wants to do a bistro, and he wants to do some multifamily and have some retail. So in this situation, Bob needs to change his zoning on his site. So let's talk about the rezoning process. The rezoning process, I'll give you kind of the gist of it first and we'll get kind of into a little bit more detail here in a second. It's roughly a two and a half to three and a half to three month process. Um, there's an application submittal. Um, there's two public hearings. There's the Zoning Commission public hearing and then there's the Council public hearing. The Zoning Commission is the formal recommending body for a zoning change. So whenever you go to your first public hearing, the Zoning Commission will make a formal recommendation. Then it goes over to City Council for the final determination. So how does this happen? So Bob needs to submit an application. We have filing deadlines. Um, and once Bob sends that application, it's important to note that whenever a zoning case goes to these public hearings, it's a public process. So because it's a public process, neighborhood associations are notified along with property owners within 300 feet. So we have a, a myriad of ways we try to notify the public to let them know that Bob is trying to change his zoning on his property. So what does that mean to the applicant? And let's kind of talk about that. So as Bob kind of, before he even kind of gets to this point, we want to make sure, step one, that Bob like looks at the map, he looks at the neighborhood database, and he has maybe a brief conversation with the council member before he even submits that zoning application. Knowing that we're gonna have two public hearings, it's in Bob's best interest to, to talk to the council member and, and, and just let them know what's coming, but it's also important that they talk to the neighborhood association and meet with them. Because when it gets to the public hearing process, we often find that the applicant hasn't even reached out to the neighborhood association and the neighborhood associations are saying they, they haven't even talked to us and we've notified them that there's a zoning change and it just doesn't look good on the applicant if you haven't reached out to the neighborhood associations or, or the council member to let them know that you're about to submit a zoning case. So that's a helpful tip. Um, if you get anything out of this discussion, if you're coming here with a zoning change, talk to those neighborhoods talk to that council member before you submit that uh, application. Uh, so once you submit your zoning application, again, we talked about the zoning commission um, and city council, but you need to provide a description of what you're doing because sometimes 
Like let's say Bob submits a zoning application. He may just say mixed use on there. But the more information y'all provide on that zoning application, the more information gets put into the staff report, which helps um, the zoning commission, city council understand what you're trying to do on that property. Because uh, as we'll see here in a second, you, you'll only have a little bit of time to present your case at the zoning commission and city council. So the more information you provide up front, the more information that gets into that staff report that the zoning commission can read prior to the public hearing. So please uh, fill out your descriptions if you're coming in. That's what Bob needs to do in this situation. So for the zoning commission, that's your first public hearing that we kind of briefly mentioned. Uh, we prepare a staff report. We're looking at the comprehensive plan. Staff is looking at surrounding land uses. And then staff is making a preliminary recommendation in this situation. Now we get this a lot, but sometimes our recommendation, the applicant is really mad that the staff has made a recommendation for something. Um, but it's important to note that whenever um, a case goes through the public process, the city council, whenever they're making their final determination, they're, na they're not making their final determination based on one factor. So there's a myriad of factors they're making their final determination on. They're looking at our staff report, which is just one. They're listening to the zoning commission recommendation, formal recommendation, that's two. They're listening to what the neighborhoods and property owners have to say, that's three. And then they're familiar with the site as well, so they're, that's how they're making their determination. So be easy on staff whenever you get that uh, negative staff report. I'm just kidding. Um, so another thing that's important is that uh, we're preparing a staff report, but again, you're still coordinating, Bob is still coordinating with the neighborhoods to try to um, ease their concerns, but you need to sign up to speak at the Zoning Commission public hearing. And at the Zoning Commission public hearing, the Bob will have five minutes to speak. So Bob is going to, create a presentation showing what he's trying to do in this situation. He's providing a PowerPoint. He's letting the zoning commission know when he talked to the neighborhoods. He's um, showing his site. He's making the case for his site. The zoning staff is not making your case or Bob's case for him in this situation. Zoning staff is basically just looking based on planning principles, surrounding land uses, encumbrance of plan. It's in Bob's best interest to make his case for himself at the Zoning Commission and City Council. So we'll have five minutes to speak. Opposition will have seven total minutes to speak. It's different than council. Council member, count at the council, everyone gets three minutes. But at the Zoning Commission, five, seven, and then the applicant gets two minutes to rebut for the case. So seven and seven, basically, for, for speaking and making your case. So the next time uh, after the Zoning Commission makes a recommendation, it doesn't matter really what the recommendation is in this situation. So if the council recommends denial, it still moves over to council. It's just a recommendation. We get a lot of um, folks say, hey, Zoning Commission deny my case. Do I still move forward? And the answer is yes, you still move forward to council because council can, can makes the final determination. And then at, at council, again, your presentation, if you provided it to us, we'll have it for you there. You'll have three minutes to speak and whoever signs up to speak will have three minutes to speak, which is different. So once city council, they're gonna make their final determination, they're gonna make a determination of approve as recommended, uh, deny with prejudice, that means that you can't come back with that same zoning case um, within a year. Deny without prejudice, that means you can come back next month with a different case or with the same case, excuse me. They may continue the case, which means that it comes back next month or next week, or they may return, um, remand it back to the zoning commission, which doesn't happen too often. So it's important to understand who we notify because again, this is a public hearing process. And if you don't do your homework beforehand, like I had mentioned before, you're, uh, you may have uh, trouble at Zoning Commission and City Council. So we notify property owners within 300 feet. We use um, something that looks just kind of like this. It shows where the map is. It has the basic information on the bottom 
of what the applicant is proposing to do. Um, and then it tells you what date the actual hearing is going to be. And then you can scan the QR code to find out more details about the zoning case. We also notify registered neighborhood organizations within a half mile. So get that information. Um, we have a neighborhood database online. If you just tap, type in neighborhood database, you can find out who, um, what neighborhoods are within your uh, half mile. Also a sign will be posted in front. So we're, we're doing all we can to let people know, hey, look, there's somebody's trying to change the zoning on here. We also have a new email listserv. So if you sign up for a certain district, you can get emails about zoning changes that are happening within your neighborhood. So that's really interesting as well. We're trying to get the word out. <clears throat> okay, uh, we also have um, information on our zoning um, on our uh, online, which is kind of a, as quickly as possible, we try to put the zoning cases up on our maps and it just has the basic information, but this helps neighborhoods and property owners and everyone know what, what's happening within their area. That's kind of a new thing that we've instituted as well. I already talked about the um, listserv. So if you're a citizen here and you get a notification that Bob is trying to rezone his property, you have a couple of options as well. You, you understand that there is a zoning commission meeting that's gonna happen and they're making a recommendation. You also have city council so it's in your best interest if you're for it or opposed to it to provide input to us about the zoning case. This is a very democratic process. You have a chance to speak on behalf of your neighborhood or you as a property owner next to the zoning case. So we ask that you provide a couple of different things. You either show up to the meeting and uh, present your opposition or support for the case or you can email us because what happens is we take all the correspondence that we receive for a zoning case and we put it into a folder for the zoning commissioners and the city council members so they can see that correspondence. So please send us your correspondence and then please provide specific reasons why you're supporting or opposing the case if you're a neighbor, especially if you're um, not in support of Bob trying to do some multifamily or mixed use in the area. So there's tons of different resources Bob can use or you can use as a neighbor. Um, we have that zoning map, we have our uh, ordinance, we have the story map that we talked about. You can watch hearings online. So we're trying, again, we're trying to get the word out about this zoning change. So um, let's swing back to Bob a little bit. We, we already know kind of what he's trying to do. 10,000 foot square foot restaurant with some uh, commercial on the bottom. Uh, so Bob has a few things that he needs to understand before he even, let's say Bob gets his approval for his zoning. He's got to understand that there's some development standards that he's got to adhere to in order to get exactly what he wants. So for example, there's setbacks along frontages. So in Bob's case, he's got to make sure that there's a maximum of 20 foot setback. He can't go any further than 20 feet. He's got to push that building close to the street. That's one thing he's got to realize. Also, parking may be an issue in this situation for Bob. Um, there's one space for 100 square feet for restaurants, and then there's multifamily parking requirements as well. So Bob needs to understand that there's parking requirements, setback requirements. Um, if he's close to residential, there's a residential height plane that takes effect. There's a buffer yard and screening next to residential. So that may impact his site as well. It may reduce the size of his building. Uh, it may push back the second story. So all these things he needs to understand before he gets to the building permit process. So also, there's street trees and ped lights in MU. So he's got to account for that. There's IPRC right down, this, down the road talking about um, the infrastructure plan review process. So Bob may have to do some infrastructure work to put those pet lights and street trees in. There's also landscape and parking. There's facade variation, fenestration, all these different things Bob needs to realize uh, before he develops his site that he has to do. Um, Bob also has to consider build, building entries um, and apartments. They need to provide uh, primary entrances 
uh, along the roads or along the um, building frontage. So all those things Bob needs to do uh, prior to submitting his building permit. So Bob also has urban forestry requirements. And we'll let. Sure. Do you want a clicker? Uh, sure, there's one there. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm Mary Wells, as, as uh, we said earlier. So I am going to talk to you a little bit about urban forestry and what that uh, means for Bob and his MU district. So first of all, the urban forestry management section, um, it, we manage the urban forest, meaning any trees on private land. Um, anything that's in parks and on public right away, the park department manages that that's just our forestry department that's just a little caveat I wanted to mention uh, now we do as Stephen mentioned we do regulate people putting in the street trees those go in the right away those are managed by the parks department I don't want to get in the weeds on that I'm just saying in general for Bob's site on his two acres it's a privately owned land and that has to come through us you can't just go mow down all your trees just because you own the land we're trying to keep the trees uh, alive and healthy. And our goal, as it states here, is 30% canopy coverage across the um, city. So <clears throat> there are two requirements in that. That means preservation and new canopy coverage, which means planting. So those are the two ways you can get your canopy coverage. So if we go back and talk about Bob real quick on his MU, um, in his MU district, so this is what that means for Bob. Um, each district has their own urban forestry standards and requirements. So for mixed use, uh, you have a 25% preservation. This gets wonky. 25% preservation, but you have to end up with 50% canopy coverage. So out of your 50%, we want you to save 25% of the trees. Um, should you not be able to do that? We send people to UDC. There is a fee uh, that goes along with that that covers the cost of the research and the um, uh, planning um, staff report and whatnot. Um, but otherwise, it's it, when I say 50%, it's 50% of your open space area. So let's say he's got a two acre lot and an acre of it is just for ease. An acre of it is gonna be open space. Of that acre, 50% of it needs to be tree covered. Um, the math of it all is a little bit uh, intense. So we have a staff that's been doing it and they are great. You are welcome to um, call us or pop in with anything that you have and we're, we'll go over your the numbers of it all. Um, but anyway, anything outside of that for Bob, you have to go to UDC. Anything outside of your requirements, we're gonna send you on to UDC. Um, that's real quick for the urban forestry, but that's it. And what questions do we have about zoning or urban forestry, Connie? The nefarious neighbors. The nefarious neighbors. Yes. Yes. We've all experienced it, and I know a number of developers. We have literally hired professional people at a very high cost to deal with that, those groups. That Public relations. Because they're, they don't understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Do you have, does the city have any tools to, to help with that so that developers don't have to hire these professionals? Maybe, maybe a sort of a, a robot outline or something that they can use to address the neighborhood? Because you do, you do have the list of all the associated. Yeah, and from a zoning perspective, we don't have anything online that kind of point, we could probably create something like that. That's probably a really good idea to, yeah. Sure. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a good idea. Uh, whenever we have our discussions with the applicant, um, because most of the time, uh, as their case is coming in, they're assigned a case manager. So the case manager kind of discusses this with them or prior to during a PDC or something like that, we let them know that the neighborhood is important to, dis to discuss what you're proposing. Um, 
And we also just talk about surrounding land uses and the comprehensive plan because sometimes what the applicant is proposing is off base and the neighborhoods are right. But in some situations, the neighborhoods can be um, off base as well. But in this situation, I, I will say this, we have a very um, good zoning commission and city council that can pick up on the times when the neighborhood associations aren't playing nice. They're pretty savvy, especially our zoning commission and city council. And they kind of understand, you know, the broader uh, aspect of the zoning case. And again, and I mentioned this a little bit um, earlier, but um, the zoning commission and city council are, are looking at all of the factors, not just, the neighborhood is one of the many factors that they're listening to whenever they're making that zoning case. Gives the budget bond and everything else, and then when is a good time? I would think that a developer needs to be proactive and not have any signs posted yet or anything, right? Because then they feel like they, they're ambushed. We don't want that. That's that's correct. No, um, it's important. Maybe um, a month or two weeks prior to even submitting that application, we have an application deadline to hit up the neighborhood associations and just let them know this is what we're thinking. Because as a developer, you want to kind of know what you're getting into prior to submitting that zoning application. Right. So it's kind of like a mini fatal flaw analysis. I think it's really got to take place during due diligence. You got to be way ahead of that, even, yeah. even more than two months. Well, a lot of these things to me are taking place in a little bit over 25 Right, right. Because this is pre-development due diligence. You've Correct. So I got a question. What is the benefit of having the city council remand back to the uh, zoning commission on the case? I mean, I would say it happens 0.1% of the time, but um, maybe they feel that the zoning commission didn't get all the facts of the case. Uh, it doesn't, it, it rarely, rarely happens, but that's probably the biggest, biggest deal. Or maybe they, in the process between zoning commission and city council, they changed what they wanted to do. So we have to send them back to re-notice uh, the rezoning change. So it's not something the applicant takes issue with. Really. That's correct. Yeah. So it's kind of like the staff order that the staff wants to go back to substantially changes the rezoning plan. Well, and can you talk about if it, if it fails at council versus being remanded, do, do they have a time where they cannot bring it back? Like, yeah. yeah. If it's denied yeah. or denied with prejudice, it's a year they can't come back with the same exact case. That's correct. You don't have to pay the second application fee. We'll work with you on that. Yes, sir. Well, another question about this. Is there any uh, community or yes, my backyard system that works? I don't think Stephen can so are all parties of notice? I mean, so say I have my lot that are parcel about their 300 feet. Should I send out more notices than what are required within the 300 feet? Are you checked on it? Is it a letter? Is it you knock on the door? What what constitutes? So let's talk about notifications. Like from a staff perspective, we're sending um, property owners within 300 feet based on. Staff does the, but it's in your interest to look at who's surrounding and, and re reach out to them. So we're doing 300 feet, for, we're required by state law 200 feet, but we do 300 feet just to make sure we get everybody. But then on top of that, we're doing neighborhood notifications, which is an email with the application um, and, and things of that nature. But who should really be notifying the neighbors is the, the, app, the applicant. That's. I mean, we're doing what we, we need to do. We're putting stuff online. We're sending these notifications out. We're putting a sign out. Staff is doing that. But it's really on the applicant to, to do their their job. I got another question. Sure. So on the urban forestry, does it only apply to the open space? Like the 50% and the parking, and the parking is considerable. So, yep. Right. Okay. And parking. Yes. Right. But I mean, are there 
good. <laughs> yes, yeah. They have open space. So, well, we know that's a question for urban forestry because you will, they will be the ones calculating. The staff calculates then how that, um, uh, how you reach your, your canopy credit. Because I'm a species by species question, so is it out on the field or is it something like wildlife side? Are you talking about the, the pre-development, the existing, um, no, we'll, uh, so you can bring in a tree survey. That's great, we really prefer that. But we'll go out and do a, um, an inspection. We'll do an inspection of, of pre-construction um, for your urban forestry one. So that really gets into your permits. So essentially there's um, two permits before your final. They all roll into each other. You're, you're submitting for one urban forestry permit, but it's a phase one and that's what's the existing. And then the phase two is what, is you, what are you proposing? Um, and so if you have a site that you cannot, we there's sites that are very hard to build on that are heavily treed, you, that's when you go to UDC. Um, and for yep, for waivers for that. And I just, while you're saying that, I don't know if I made a mention that the, the um, so MU has the street trees and ped lights, as Stephen said, and that is in addition to the urban, those do not count towards your credit. The, the parking does. Correct. They're in the right of way. They'll be maintained by parks. We're just consider, you know, um, looking at what's on your site, what you'll be maintaining, and then you do have a two-year um, preservation requirement. Um, they'll come out after you've all you're all d done, and make sure that the trees that were existing, I believe it's the trees that were existing, is t maintained uh, are still living at two years, and the trees you planted at five. It might be might be vice versa. Sorry. But there's a two-year and a five-year um, inspection that will happen after the fact to make sure that the trees are still healthy and living. And, and if not, then you have to, like, that is based on commercial or a residential, anything over an acre. That if you build a residential subdivision, if you find a little seedy tree. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, funny you should say that, Anzeta, because we just got an urban forest. <laughs> we just we did just get our first urban forestry inspector, and he is inspecting thousands of acres a month, um, because there wasn't. It was we were having a really really hard time. In those situations, a lot of the times though, the HOAs were kind of staying on top of it. Um, the other thing is a little caveat to all that: if you preserve something and it dies, you have to plant five times what was supposed to be planted. So we really are doing a lot of diligence for you. We really, the trees are very, very important. So. So when you have a tree survey done for the pre-development, mm -hmm. obviously sometimes these things take a while. If you're, how long can you use a tree survey before it has to be Oh, that's a really good question. I'm not really sure, but I'll get your contact and I'll let you know. I'm, I'm gonna have to ask staff how long a tree survey is. is. Uh, some cities, Yeah, five years seems excessive to me, but I don't know that answer, and I'll get it for you for sure. Yeah. Can you do trees if you think if the existing trees already in the way of the building? Can you just like pick it up? Pick them up and move. We would love it if you would pick it up and move the tree. That would be fantastic. Versus, yeah, it, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, that's definitely an option. As long as you're meeting that canopy coverage. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So you guys talked about uh, pre-field zone changes. What about some existing building? You know, is it, and you don't meet the parking requirements or you don't meet the accessibility or the tree coverage anymore. It's like a whole new process to get into this existing building. You can only get the zone change until you do those stuff. Like So in, in your scenario, they would probably already have the zoning allowed. Let's let's go that route first, okay? So let's say they do have a MU and they're doing an infill development existing building. They're already platted. 
then they can go straight to building permit. And then whenever they get to building permit, as staff is reviewing, they're going to find out, oh, they don't meet parking, they don't meet this and, and that as they're going through that process. So that's when the UDC, Urban Design Commission, and possibly Board of Adjustment comes into effect. So if you don't meet like certain requirements, you would go to the Urban Design Commission to request a waiver. Mm, okay. So if you have an existing church and you want to make it into a restaurant, right? Does that still apply to that scenario? Yeah. So <laughs> let's say you have a church and it's probably zone CF or something like that. You'd rezone the rezone it to do what Bob wants to do, or you just want to make it a restaurant, mm -hmm. then it's a very similar scenario. If your zoning isn't correct, you have to change the zoning. But then once you have the correct zoning uh, to allow the use, you have to go through to get your certificate of occupancy. And that's when they're going to look. They're going to look at the parking. You don't have enough parking. You need to go to the Board of Adjustment. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So it just depends. Each scenario is different, but it follows the, the foundational processes. Thank you. Sir. Speaking of parking, now that we have the one called Wood Zone, whatever Conscience is called, right? What is it called? On demand. Thank you. On demand from uh, Trinity Metro. And they are expanding the geography of that. And they have Wood Zone going up to Oak. Anyway, now that we have more ride share options in Fort Worth, in addition to parking, do they make some waivers for parking? It's going to depend on the situation. It's going to depend on the location. Um, I mean, yeah, they have. It, it depends a lot on the situation. So, for example, you have a lot of infill development where somebody wants to put a restaurant in an existing shopping center. That would go to the Board of Adjustment, and the Board of Adjustment would look at that hardship, knowing that, yeah, this has been here for 40 years, and no more parking can be added. Uh, this one's in Blue Bonnet Circle. I mean, what, what can you do in this situation? So uh, either Board of Adjustment um, is, is the release valve in that situation. I want to say that if the city authority decided to do parking reform and that was their zoning plan, we should all show up and support them. Yes. yes. To get them to find a way that they can get yeah. the seven to nine. That's my big question about the revised zoning and the city plan. Do they get support to do that? Have they made parking requirements so popular that they hope I have a general zoning question and it's in reference to kind of miss the middle housing. I've, I've heard like in the kind of chat on that I've had with people who talk about like gate zoning, but those were in pretty highly dense areas where the city could really benefit with this kind of infill development of these more different housing types within existing neighborhoods. Do y'all have a plan as like a general overlay? I know you have like the A, B, C, and D for national level units. Um, how can y'all as a staff kind of supercharge this development of this product type within these A5 different um, neighborhoods? And what was y'all's issue with ADUs? And why hasn't that been a solution? Wow, hold on. <laughs> yeah. uh, Well, I mean, it's a complicated project. I mean, complicated. No, it is. Um, I will say this is I'm, I think. Um, in the near future, we'll have something more with the missing middle. Um, we're, we're kind of on the forefront of doing some missing middle changes, but those won't come with council initiated rezoning changes. So a lot of our council initi initiated rezonings are where we're taking uh, more dense development to single family. Um, so what you will see is probably an ordinance amendment that gives the developer the tools to rezone property to these new missing middle housing typologies as opposed to wholesale rezonings of areas. And that, that's the near term. You may see that in the latter half. So it sounds like you're 
are going to expedite the process a hell of a lot and I want to move into a higher density use and get it done by the process and put somebody to stay in this lot in a single family for like four plus or like four or eight or whatever it is. So I like the end result. It kind of speeds up a lot of the stuff. It wouldn't speed it up. What we would do is provide more clear, better tools okay. for the developer to use and to seek whenever they're going to the rezoning process. And then I will say this, uh, we kind of uh, briefly talked about the comprehensive plan and how that's the guide for growth. Well, the comprehensive plan really hasn't been updated, updated in a while. And now it's in the process of getting updated. So I think we'll see a lot of, it, it's hard uh, from a staff perspective um, and zoning commission perspective to look at a, an area from the comprehensive plan perspective that's zoned a5 with future land use of a5 and say let's allow multifamily in this location because it kind of has three strikes against it land use comprehensive plan but with the comprehensive plan update that allows us a little bit more leeway to recommend approval for certain kinds of projects and then on the other hand you will have hopefully in the near future uh, re not rezoning but um ordinance updates so combining those two will hopefully help the developer out. Yeah, they're coming back with the intro ordinance. And that's mm -hmm. that. Right. So that's coming real soon. So it's, it's on our minds, and we're definitely doing things to try to push it that way. So, But we do. It's, it's, um, I wouldn't say it's an uphill battle, but I will say that uh, we've got a lot of, we've got to consider not just the developer aspect. We also got to consider the neighborhoods and what the council members wishes are in these situations.